So good day, everyone, and thank you so, so much for having me. This is my first keynote ever. And it is also my first Open Hardware Summit, yay twice. And I'm going to get started um, and talk to you a little bit about Robotics for the Streets, open source robotics for academics and the community. I do a lot of podcasts and a lot of interviews and everybody always wants to know, what does robotics for the streets mean? It means that even though I'm a PhD and I'm a professor, if only my students and the people that pay tuition and the people that go to conferences and the people who pay for um, paywall journals have access to my knowledge, then I'm doing my job wrong. So robotics for the streets means robotics for everyone. And so this is called scholarship reconsidered. As a professor, my job is to have scholarship of discovery, integration, application, and teaching. And I have to look at all of this through a holistic view. So that means when I'm teaching, I talk about my research. When I'm talking about my teaching, I'm talking about how do you apply it to real world significant things. I talk about the integration. You're an electrical engineer, but you need to be able to do some computer science, some mechanical engineering. Humanities, engineering students hate humanities courses. All that stuff is important. And also the scholarship of discovery. I teach at a primarily undergraduate university, science, engineering, and mathematics. However, we still have to do research, but I do my research with undergraduate students. So the first thing I have to acknowledge is that everything you've seen today is either me or my babies. I still call them babies. They will always be my babies. So uh, during the pandemic, I was on sabbatical. Thank God. And <laughs> one thing I came up with is I had to have a way to describe. It's like the Jerry Maguire at the beginning of the movie when he has this epiphany about how to do his job. I had this epiphany about how to my, do my job and I didn't know how to, how to describe it. And so I came up with this term, noir stimulus. And it was a way for me to share on social media all these new things that I had and a way for people to find it. So I had to come up with some term that people did not typically use that was kind of made up so that if I searched that term, I knew my stuff would show up. So that's where it came from. But what it means is that I bring robotics and STEM to people and I bring people to robotics and STEM to educate and diversify the profession. That leads right into open source robotics. So the mo motivation and purpose for my project was to create a low cost open source robot to provide access to communities that may be marginalized or minoritized in STEM. To make a robot that was modular enough to be able to add and remove things as you want it to, controllers, sensors, peripherals, to meet you where you want it to be and where you want it to go to be flexible enough that academics or the community could use it for a service, STEM outreach, to teach people, to do research, et cetera, and to be appropriate for everyone from a novice user to an expert level user, K through 12 teachers, university professors, graduate students, academics, makers, professionals, or just somebody that just wants to see the robot move. So the reason mobile robotics is really great for this is because it is inherently multidisciplinary. A robot is a machine that uses knowledge, software, and mechanics, gears, motors, et cetera, and sensors, electronics to move in the world. But eventually, we hope, other than the Roomba vacuum cleaner, if we have robots to interact with us, there has to be a human component as well. My PhD is in human-robot interaction. How do you design robots that don't creep people out, <laughs> right? Robots that people are comfortable being able to figure out how to use, et cetera. So you're going to need sociologists, psychologists, assistive technologists, biomedical engineers. So robotics is great because no matter what you tell me you're interested in, I can show you something on the robot you can do with it. I also do a lot of presentations for kids where we talk about, they're like, I want to do art. Okay, STEAM it is. Let's make our robot dance. Let's make our robot sing. Let's make our robot draw, right? So Robotics for the Streets, my project was building from hardware to software to control because robots do the three primitives, sense, plan, and act, no matter what your robot has to do. So my project was in, developed into three stages where we iterated on the hardware, we thought about the software, and we thought about the controls. One reason why I'm so excited about this project is I have a one-hour drive to work every day. And I thought of the vision for this robot in my commute. And the fact that we're now using this thing is kind of amazing to me. So in our design, what I came up with is that at these levels, it's essentially the same robot. They're called flower bots. It was a play on flower pots. Okay, never mind. 
<laughs> but so, so building up LilyBot is our smallest robot. That's the robot you would use for K through 12, for children, for K through 12 teachers. It's the smallest. It has a few little sensors on it. Not very big. Daisy Bot is the next level up. That's for education for more advanced high school students or freshmen in college. And then Rosie Bot is our most advanced platform, which would be used for college students, grad students, makers, et cetera. But I wanted to show it kind of as a Venn diagram because it doesn't matter. Start where you want. You can use Daisy Bot with kids if you want, because that's the whole benefit of it being modular. You do with it what you want. Right. I've, um, I, I was talking about it in a minute. I had people write back and go, so why doesn't the robot have this? You put that on it. Well, why didn't you do this? Well, you do that. That's what open source means. I was telling somebody earlier, I have a colleague at Georgia Tech who wants to use my robot for her summer program this summer. And she said, I need to order 20 more. Oh, no, baby, it don't work like that. <laughs> that is what open source means. You go find a 3D printer and you make your own. I gave you one robot. So, so as part of my design, um, we originally started in Tinkercad and we switched over to SolidWorks. I have computer science, mechanical engineering, electrical and computer engineering students on this project. The benefit in that is they learn as much from me as I do from them. So day one, my ME student said, I'm changing to SolidWorks. I don't like Tinkercad. You do what you want as long as you do what I ask you to do. Okay. <laughs> and so then we also, we 3D printed everything. I had to learn 3D printing for this project which was so awesome. I had one of my evaluators say to me, why didn't you do laser cut? I didn't, but you can, right? So once again, everybody wants to tell me what I can do. The whole point is it's open source, you do it, right? And so in our electronics, we have spritzing Tinkercad software. And then in the software, because of some kids, I did it in Arduino Sketch. And I also had a mentor show me how to um, write scratch makey blockly code that then converts automatically to Arduino. So another mentor shared with me that I had to have a choose your own adventure type of a way to approach this project. So depending upon where you're coming in, I have these learning roadmaps on the website. So you can say, I don't even know where to start. Okay, well, if you're just thinking, I know nothing, you start with Lilybot. You know, just a tiny bit Daisybot, you know more Rosybot. And then there are some learning activities. We are still building out some of the curriculum. So you will see some examples of that. Um, I have blogs on my website. I have videos on YouTube. I have code on GitHub and the CAD files. I have the projects on Instructables and Hackster.io, and I also have content on social media. I am a social media star. I don't know if you knew that. Um, so I have content on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Mastodon, and Spatable, but you can't fit all of that on the slide. So here's just an example. So good day, lovers. It's Dan. Yeah. Today we're going to use graphical programming to, to do motion to control on the robot, and we're using the EduKit um, graphical programmer here. So what you will see here is just like we do in regular microcontroller code. Okay. We have a setup function, we have a loop function, and then we have the port. Okay, so I, I don't want to play the whole thing. Hi, my name is Carlotta Berry, and I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering and robotics, um, and I'm also an open. Okay, sorry, I didn't realize I couldn't like stop the videos. Okay, that's okay. So I'm just giving some snippets of my examples. Go watch it on social media if you want to see the whole thing. So some of the tutorials that I um, have created are on motion control, obstacle avoidance, bang bang control, proportional control, how to blink LEDs, how to play sounds, how to track light, how to drive the robot with a PlayStation controller, with an IR remote, many more to come. And what I found is by far, no matter how much content I created, everyone who evaluated me and my robot was like, you need more content. I'm still a professor and I still have to do my day job. Okay, so here are some examples of the ways people have used my robots. We had a spark design competition at Rose Holman where middle and high school students designed the robot to do obstacle avoidance to move in a race to a finish line. And they also drove the robot with a PlayStation controller to navigate various terrains. If you look at the images as I'm speaking, you will see more images of that. We also had high school students in Detroit, Michigan, who built my robot to wire electronics, program the robot to do motion control. This teacher has asked me to continue to work with her students as they do the Squared One Education Innovation Challenges with my robot, as well as for a summer program. This is how you build and program your robot. First, we assembled the robot by watching a YouTube tutorial. Then we wired the robot. Then we created a code for the robot to perform. The most challenging part was wiring the robot. 
The most interesting part was coding the robot and watching it perform. I'm trying to let it finish, but thank you so much for watching this. <laughs> please give me an A. <laughs> I had to play the end. I love the please give me an A part. I had to let the part go. So the next, um, one of my other evaluators was some colleagues at Indiana University Bloomington in the School of Informatics, and their students took a kind of like um, mechatronics course, and they did prototypes. So they built the Daisy Bot and designed a top for it in order to do human interaction. They wired the electronics, programmed the robot for motion control and obstacle avoidance. This was my only evaluator that actually hung stuff on my robot. So I had to show them because I don't know what that thing is. I'm calling it a turtle. <laughs> Then I had some gradu gra graduate students at Louisiana State University who evaluated the robot by adding on a camera that they then created an Android app for that remotely drove the robot and used the camera. So it's a surveillance robot and they're actually currently writing a paper on the project that they did with the robot in order to present at a conference. So I want to show a little bit of theirs as well. And by special request, some of my um, open source hardware trailblazer fellow colleagues asked to, for me to share my robot slam poetry, which I also started during the pandemic. So I made a video um, with Lilybot just for them. And the goal of this work is to normalize seeing black and brown people doing robotics in STEM because we are minoritized and marginalized in STEM, to teach novice users about robotics concepts and inspire kids to get excited about learning STEM and to illustrate the intersections between art and STEM. Here comes Malcolm Explorer, also known as Detroit Red. Why is he so cool? That's his sensors, they're infrared. IR measures distance by sending out invisible light. It figures out how long it takes to come back. That's time of flight. Robots gotta be safe, so IR keeps them from hitting stuff. If not for Asimov's laws, life with robots would be tough. Won't you come and join me as I build my robot team? Learning all about this stuff is really quite a dream. I said I was musically inclined, but once again, thank you. <laughs> so that is also another example of showing the integration of arts and STEM. I have about five of those. I have Rosie Sparks and several others. So you can check out my YouTube channel if robot slam poetry is your thing. So I want to talk a little bit about how my flower bots were evaluated. I shipped robots out to academics, practitioners, graduate students, postdocs. I recruited my um, evaluators, obviously robotics for the streets, from social media, from listservs, from black and robotics, black and engineering, the African American robotics, PhD listservs, as well as the future of mechatronics and robotics. Shipping and building all these robots was not for the weak at heart. Um, the task the participants had to complete was to build the robot or finish building it, wire electronics, program several learning activities, and complete an online survey. Of that, 22 people actually completed the survey. That's 50%, I'll take it. So the gender identities was right at about half and half. Obviously, I'm an academic, so the majority of my um, evaluators were academics and then people in corporate America. I also had some makers on TikTok who, who also did it as well. And the race and ethnicity, obviously, it's my community, so the majority of the people were Black or African American. But I did have some white, mixed race, Asian, and Peruvian as well. And most of them were either college students, college professors, graduate students, et cetera. So I half and half, I sent Lily Bot and Daisy Bot. Rosie Bot, and Rosie is also my school's mascot, so that's where Rosie came from. Rosie is our research robot, and you know, all dreams happen, but Rosie just did not make it out. Rosie is built, but didn't make it to anybody. So what you will see here is that robotics proficiency with five being the highest, most people were right along the spectrum. Had a lot of computer scientists ask for the robot, which is why the coding is, is skewed a little bit more to the right. Um, not as many people were proficient in electronics and why that's important is some of the feedback I got from some was, like I said, I need more learning materials. I don't know what a breadboard is. I don't know what a sonar is. I don't know what an Arduino is. So I did make some assumptions even for the novice 
that even if I didn't tell them all of that, they Google bad assumption. I know students don't always do that either unless it's chat GPT. But so, so, so sometimes I, I now know that I have got to really scale back and make more videos of this is an infrared sensor and this is what it does, but that's some things. Some people also had some issues with the 3D printing. I know that 3D printing is not perfect. It, perfect, it, it, it depended on the filament. Some of the issues with the motor mounts not being completely matched. We have now fixed some of these, but not by the time that these were completed. I know you can't read all this and this is bad PowerPoint 101, but <laughs> I did not want to take people's good comments away. So I just left them there. So these are comments from users. Um, I like some of them because some of my goals were mentioned in them, like large level ex of expansion. There were a few things that are inaccessible, but I think this really helps for students who have no familiar robotics at all. And so the, the question was, I want to use these robots for K through 12 outreach. How well do you think it met that mission? So most people were four or five and thought that it did not. And people who did not explain to me why, and the main reasons were, they don't feel there was enough explanation for kids to be able to walk to this on their own and be able to do it. It was my hope that a teacher or parent or mentor could help, but if they don't know either, then, you know, there you go. The second question was, how well do you think these robots meet the mission of being a, a, a acceptable for high school or college freshmen? Once again, most people thought it did. Some people felt it's hard to beat the cost and flexibility of the robot. My estimate is $50, including the 3D printing. Um, but then you also get all the online learning materials. I try to use SparkFun as my standard for how good learning materials have to be, by the way. You know. <laughs> Yep, that was on purpose. Okay, so then the last one was, how well do you think these robots meet the mission of being able to use for research? I didn't expect this one to be very high because I didn't ship anybody the Rosie bot, which was a robot for research. But even the ones that they got, some people felt worked. I had one professor at University of Michigan who is using my robot to onboard his new graduate students. He's in computer science. Some computer science programs have no hands-on learning. So he's having the students do my robot first because they need to get that electronics experience before they can even start doing the research for the lab. So as far as research for him, the robots were a win. So I will um, had several people who said they want to use my robot as professors for their research experience for undergraduates, their programs for um, STEM outreach as well. And this is my daughter. She shows up in all my presentations somewhere, whether you know it or not, because that's my only baby and she has to. But um, so several people have requested that I continue to work with them on this to help them to figure out how to scale it to use with their kids and use for summer programs as well as teaching, et cetera. And then here's another one um, where this person was working and people were asking about it, but they also gave me some feedback about ways to redesign the robot. I, I receive all of the feedback and I do want to make the robot better, but I'm also trying to encourage people, everything is online. You could always make your own battery case. You could always redesign the chassis how you want. But I think that's what they thought I wanted when I really wanted to know how is it as a learning tool, as a service tool, as a teaching tool. But yeah, tell me how to fix the robot as well. You know, maybe I will, maybe I want. So in the background, I'm also showing more videos of just the different things that we, we, we sh the videos we do have online for the robot. So here is the high school competition that I mentioned where the robot had to drive on various terrain. And this person actually said, with more heavy documentation, documentation is the key. And more importantly, it shows how different disciplines aggregate within this field. That's great. That's a big part of what I wanted them to get out of this. And although it's not a critical component, it could also be used for robotics research, depending upon what your needs are. So in conclusion, I think that robots, obviously self-serving, and this is what I do, is ideal for showing connections between multiple disciplines. It's uniquely equipped to create intersections between teaching, research, and service. And it can be used to educate and entice future scholars to transmit, transform, and extend knowledge, and a great tool for recruiting diverse populations to STEM. And open source robotics can help address issues with equity and bias in STEM by increasing access and affordability to a more diverse community. I also have a scholarship program at my school, Rose Building Undergraduate Diversity. They designed that um, competition that you saw. So these are some of my students. I wanted to show them as well. Why that video didn't play, I don't know. Okay, I give up. It's, it's a cute one though, all right? So as part of my future work, I'm going to present a paper on the FlowerBots platform at the Frontiers in Education Conference in October. 
From there, with my undergraduate students, most of their first paper is going to be publishing about the flyer bots and IEEE transactions on Education Journal. So I do put some stuff behind paywalls. That's what professors have to do. But it is also online. Don't forget that. So and then I want to create more online curriculum and activities for the flower bots and put it on YouTube, Hex.io, Instructables, GitHub, etc. I am also supporting several faculty, as I said, who are planning to use my robot for teaching, service, and research. I'm working with one of my mentors, Ginger, wherever Ginger is, to, I don't know, um, to hopefully launch a Kickstarter to garner more support for flower bots so we can explore potentially selling it. My school actually recently um, decided that they don't own any IP for any of the professor's work, so they don't care if I sell it or do whatever. Um, and also thanks to Ginger, I am collaborating with Arduino and VM Robotics in order to um, give feedback on some of their robotics education projects. I never ever leave a presentation without mentioning the other two organizations that I helped co-found during the pandemic, Black in Engineering and Black in Robotics. You can learn more about them at their websites, but their goals are to support Black faculty and researchers, practitioners and students in engineering, serve as a resource for community building, share experiences with implicit bias and systemic racism, provide action items to address racial injustice, identify and collect with, connect with allies, advocates, collaborators, and sponsors, and bring together Black researchers, professionals, academics, and students in robotics, advocate for more diversity, inclusion, and equity, ensure a seat at the table during development, test, and deployment of robotic systems, and amplify our collective voices in social justice. And there were many members of these committees, communities that actually evaluated the robots as well. So I want to say thank you to my research students. Alex is one of them. He's in this video here. The technicians that helped with the robot building when it got completely out of control. And my administrative assistant at my department who helped box and ship these robots, including two to Africa and one to Colombia. So I also want to thank um, the Open Source Hardware Association for making me a Trailblazer Fellow, as well as the Sloan Foundation. Tad Scott for telling me about that, that fellowship. Alicia and Licia and Lee, who have been extremely helpful, all my robot evaluator participants, and my mentors. I had five of them. I, I alternated every month. Ginger, Brandon, Washu, Cesar, and Elizabeth. And with that, I am done. Thank you so much. <laughs>